the recording. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to get started here. So uh, today's lecture is going to be on using AWS for data science. So those of you who've had experience with AWS, this will be a little bit of review. I hope there will be a few slides that will be useful for you guys, but for the rest of you, I think this is probably one of the most essential parts of data science and actually just like anything related to software engineering in general because AWS is like a really critical skill or just general server management is going to be very important for your future if you plan on doing anything related to software engineering or uh, data science or anything like that. Cool. So agenda is pretty short, uh, why servers, and then just I'm just going to demonstrate how to start an instance on AWS. So uh, let me give you a scenario. So let's say you're training a cat versus dog classifier. You're uh, about 30 minutes away from starting class, and um, you find out that your laptop is overheating, your fan's just going crazy, and your accuracy is barely improved. Your battery's dying, and like you have, you only have a limited amount of time before you can actually, well, while you can still train before your battery dies and yet you're busy and you have to use your computer for something else. So what do you do? You can, one, hope that your, your classifier finishes training. Now that's pretty unlikely because like uh, you're, you're really low accuracy, whatever. So the next step would probably be like, okay, what if you just stop training now and you resume when you charge, when you can charge back up again. But a common problem when you're like running a algorithm or you're training something is that you probably just forgot to uh, set up something to save your progress. And so what's going to happen is you're, you're like going to end your classifier and you're going to basically have to start from square one again and you lose all that time that you've already spent training. And then uh, your third option is to just to give up, change your field, and then go become one with nature. So um, it's a great option. Yeah, you can, you can do that anytime. Uh, please talk to me if you want to try it out. It's pretty fun. Um, but that's, uh, that's also pretty lame. So <laughs> you can uh, you, you lose a lot of that progress. You lose a lot of that time that you spent here. And so hey, uh, do as you will. Realistically, we just need a better solution than that, all of those. And so as you probably guessed, it's train on a server, specifically with AWS. So um, training on a server basically just allows you to uh, use an, a completely different hardware and it, uh, somewhere lo located somewhere else so that you can just run your data science models, so or train your data science models. So the great benefits of this is that it requires a lot less power, a lot less uh, laptop power because you, when you connect to that server, you're basically just asking for the shell commands and everything. And then um, you can connect from anywhere, so it doesn't matter whether or not your laptop explodes or something that day. You can always find a different computer, go to like Cori or something like that, and then use those computers there. And then um, Additionally, you'll probably use better hardware than your laptop. As, uh, this is especially important with things like neural networks, where the best hardware, the best hardware to use is traditionally like graphics processor units, GPUs, because those just happen to work better with matrix operations, which are very critical in neural networks and a lot of machine learning applications in general. Now, probably the biggest con about actually using a server is how much it actually costs. So if you built your own server, it's probably going to end up in the several thousand dollars. Like, there's an MLab server right now that's costing us like seven thousand dollars, and it's it's ridiculous. It doesn't work right now. So clearly, it was a, uh, that's been a lot of pain. So not only that, I guess it's it not only does it cost money, it actually costs a lot of time to act, to build it and everything like that. And that's something we're learning as a club <laughs> right now. So uh, yeah. However, we can get rid of this actual this con right here. We can move and use Amazon uh, Web Services. And so um, the great thing is, as a student, you can actually get $100 of free Amazon credit. I tried to make that very clear through Piazza Post and everything. So if you haven't done this yet, go to AWS Educate right now and uh, get your $100 of free Amazon credit. What's up? It's a well. Okay, here's the great thing. So you have three Berkeley email aliases, and so like do as you will with that. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and if you're in MLab, we can get you more emails. So, <laughs> okay, but yeah, the great thing is though, Amazon has a free tier. So if you just really want like a computer that's um, that's just running on the cloud, you don't really care about the hardware. You just want something that will run even if your laptop's off. Then you can use the free tier, which has a uh, kind of a basic instance. It's like two gigabytes of RAM and like. I don't know, two cores of processor, 
but it's 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 still um, not running on your machine, so you just SSH in, you connect to it, and then you just let it run. So alternatively, there's uh, Microsoft Azure, which is very similar to AWS. I heard the interface is like okay in comparison to AWS. I mean, AWS isn't that great, but um, Azure actually is offering two hundred dollars of credit for um, students as well, and I think their GPU uh, servers are about the same quality. They're basically the same hardware and everything, so you can use that instead. But I've never used it, so I, I don't know what to say. What's up, Mortaza? How much does, like, this money so actually, I'm gonna. I think I get into that in the next thing. Oh no. So I'll get in, into that in a second. But the price of Azure and AWS for like a GPU unit are the same, or roughly the same. Um, however, there's like uh, there's a niche thing about AWS that I'm not sure is available on Azure. It's like very likely because you could easily architect it. But I'll get into that um, in a few slides. So um, yeah, as I said, I haven't used Microsoft Azure. So if you're gonna go try it, you're kind of in the dark. I don't know how to help you. Um, if you if you really are gung ho about it, maybe I can go try try to learn it for you. But um, stick with AWS for now. It just works. Um, Cool, but before I get into like d diving into AWS, it's important to know that Berkeley actually has server resources for you. So if you really just needed to use something in the order of like a free tier, so just kind of a simple machine that has like barely good hardware, but you or like just run in the background, um, yeah, you can just use Berkeley's servers. So uh, here's a website right here that I found very useful. It's by a student, Alan Guo. Uh, I think he was my TA, or he was a TA in one of the classes I took. A while ago, but he basically published a list of all of these servers in all the Berkeley servers that have like the lowest load. So you can go in, go find the best, ser the most open servers, and uh, you can find your login credentials here. So typically, you have to be in a CS class, unfortunately. So if you're not uh, this semester, then uh, you're kind of out of luck. But um, the way to account, the way to connect is by simply finding your username through this link. Uh, make sure you've registered and everything. Find your password through the proper forms. And then you just have to run this command in your terminal. So SSH username at whatever server is listed here. Let me show you this actually real quick. So this is the hive mind, whatever. All you need to do is go here, click server name, let's go to iterm, and like SSH CS 189ABC at that uh, at that URL. Any questions about that? Cool. Um, this won't work because uh, that is not my account but um, try it out on your own I don't know my password so I haven't done this this semester um so you can so I like to put everything in github and I just oh, use okay. git you just yeah you just get pull and they have git installed I think it's an Ubuntu server so it has git already um, there is a problem though they, these Berkeley server resources are very limited. Like you can't go in and start installing a bunch of programs. So they have limits on like um, you, you're not given admin credentials on the Berkeley servers. So if you're just trying to do stuff with Python, you can get away with it, and it works pretty well. So like if you're doing stuff with 189, you'll get a, you'll you'll do pretty well with it. Um, otherwise, if you want to try to use things like Docker on it, it won't let you because I don't think they've installed Docker on the machines, yeah, or the last time I checked. Yeah, so yeah, I think you can pip install. You there will be one like gotcha though, is um, I don't know if you've ever had problems with pip and like just doing regular pip install stuff. The like quick and easy hack for pip, if it if like something fails, is just do like pip install. Let's say numpy fails. You just do dash dash user. And then for some reason this fixes stuff. So this is the magic flag that you need to add. So there's no spaces, dash dash user. Um, that's like way out of there, but in case you ever run into a problem, that's your magic go-to. But yeah, as I, was, as I was saying, it's limited. So the best thing to do is go use an Amazon server anyways. So you get access to your own virtual machine, which means you can install anything. Um, and you can pretty much try to break it. I think they do a pretty good job of securing everything. So. Um, it is like a true isolated virtual machine. Any questions about that? They stopped giving out emails? You don't have one? Did you, you went to this link? Yeah. Um, did you, you signed in and everything? Yeah. It says there's no port for file. Oh, what? 
Um, maybe it's somewhere else. Look up Eek's instructional accounts or something. But maybe I'll, I'll get back to this after uh, after class. Okay, so quick rundown of what AWS is. Um, it is a cloud computing service. So that means it has a bunch of different um, a bunch of different services you, it could provide. So the main st thing we're going to be focusing on is the EC2 service, the container service, as they call it. Actually, sorry, that's something different. Um, just the EC2 service, Elastic Compute. I think that's what it stands for. And uh, basically just means that there's a bunch of VMs that let you uh, run on a bunch of different kinds of hardware. So depending on what your application is, maybe you can have you would want a lot of RAM or something like that. You could go find a machine that has a shit ton of RAM. Uh, alternatively, if you need high processor speed, you can find that. And then what we'll probably use the most in this class, or what I actually end up using the most, is the uh, graphics card instances. So the ones that provide you with a, um, a GPU for relatively cheap. But uh, yeah, there's a bunch of other things. There's like uh, database management. There's like long-term storage. So you can go from like S3, which is what most websites use to serve like images, to um, I think they have literally tape storage, which is apparently the cheapest and lo most long-term storage method ever. And so um, yeah, you can store stuff for like 30 years, 30 years if you really need that. So yeah, um, as long as you pay the price, right? So uh, as I as I talked about before, there's the free tier on Amazon which gives you 750 hours on this kind of basic instance called the T2 Micro. And uh, they, give, they give you that for about a year after sign up. Um, so that means 750 hours is roughly enough to run that instance for a month straight. So um, yeah, it's pretty great if you want to just run stuff quickly, just you play around with Amazon, get used to how everything works. Um, cool. Now the GPU instances are under the P2 name. So there's a bunch of different levels, but the one that I focus on is the P2X large. That's just the GPU instance that has one single um, GPU. So it basically gives you access to a $4,000 GPU. I forget the exact one. I think it's like Pascal Titan X or something like that. Not, not well versed in this, but um, yeah, you can compare that to just getting a GTX 1080, which is like top of the line consumer consumer model for $600. Um, which basically at $9 an hour, it gives you 600 hours, which is roughly a little bit less than a month of uh, straight running. Um, but also you have to consider that when you when you would buy your own GPU, you have to buy the entire um, computer as well. So all things considered, it is a lot cheaper just to use AWS for most use cases in my mind. Additionally, you're always going to get the best hardware. And uh, as GPU hardware in particular changes a lot, Especially for um, applications in like deep learning, it's it's pretty much a good idea to just use AWS for the moment because that means you can always guarantee you're using the best stuff. Cool. Now a dollar an hour is pretty good, but we can actually keep going cheaper. So there's this thing called spot instances on AWS. Basically, they let you rent um, pretty much any type of instance for something like seventy percent of the cost, or sorry, thirty percent of the cost on average. Um, for for example, the G, the GPU instances under the name P2X Large, uh, they go from they they go from the uh, standard price of ninety cents an hour down to about twenty five cents to thirty five cents an hour, which is really nice. That means you're basically you're basically uh, triple the amount of time you can spend um, for the same amount of money. Um, so yeah, super cheap. But uh, what the pro what spot instances basically are. They're basically bidded instances. So you're fighting against companies and everybody else who's trying to get GPU time. So what can happen is um, somebody may come in and they may want to use a bunch of uh, GPU instances for whatever compute job they have. And then they'll end up bidding it all the way up to 90 cents. And so if you choose not to keep your bid at that price, if you choose to set your max bid at like 50 cents, then you may end up losing your data because it'll end your instance and it'll delete your drives if you haven't set it up correctly. Um, but there is a way to avoid losing your data and to making sure that your um, your drives are kept and so you can access them later. But um, yeah, I've been close to losing like a lot of work through this. So make sure that you're very careful about how you preserve your volumes. And I'll show you how to make sure that you preserve your data with all this stuff. Okay, cool. So I'm going to run through a demo right now on just like setting up your own P2X Large, the GPU machine, and um, just go step by step and hopefully... I can answer any questions that may come up while I'm doing this. Cool. So first thing you need to do is sign in to the AWS console. Oh, I'm not signed in. 
So if we go um, go to your EC2 but, uh, link, and then what you want to do is you'll go to your spot request um, tab right here. And so you just press this big request spot requests re spot, bleh, request spot instances button. And so the first thing I'm going to do is select an AMI. And um, as a note, I'm just going to use this, but I actually have a deep learning AMI. And it's not my uh, deep learning AMI, but it's another one that I typically use. So this is the one that I have on this account because this is the one I was using for a few other projects. Um, it's called something. So. But uh, if I, you guys can go to Deep AWS, and I think it's actually linked into, it's actually linked in the repo, and you can find this guide right here, which I basically run through the proper AMI to use. So it's uh, M I E J Go Deeper, and so this guy just gives a bunch of AMI IDs. So actually, I'll just start from here. Um, what you really need to do is figure out what region you're in. I'll close this real quick. So I'm currently in Oregon. And then um, I go to the AMI ID, the, the row in the call in this table, and then grab the AMI ID with respect to Oregon. Go to search for AMI. Go to community AMIs, I think. Cool. And then you see this right here. We have to go deeper. Select this. And um, now I'm going to select the type of instance. So P2X large, and as you can see here, oh, okay, never mind. So spot price is pretty high right now. Let's see. So right now we're actually in a spike, I think, of usage. As you can see here, this is like uh, in this particular zone. Somebody's been requesting like ridiculous. Yeah, I guess th that zone is ridiculously high right now. That's really surprising. But um, yeah, I guess we're kind of in a in a spike zone. Maybe I can change the regions and it'll be better. Uh, so I usually switch between um, Oregon and North Virginia because uh, this, this tend to work best. So I'll go back to my trusty table, uh, grab North Virginia. Oh, okay, yeah. Let me take a step back and explain what AMIs are. They're basically just images with a bunch of pre-installed um, software on them. So this particular one has like a bunch of deep learning software already. So things like TensorFlow, Theano, uh, and X number of other deep learning libraries, plus like some extra things like Microsoft CNTK. The whole list is available on this um, on this repo right here, which is linked to from this guide. I'm fairly certain it's in the repo. Uh, could you could you check that for me, Shannon? Whether this this guide is in the the Kaggle Decal repo? Yeah. Thanks. So I'll paste that AMI in. Oh, it's not my AMIs. Oh, okay, cool. That actually worked. Let's see what the pricing is. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about AMIs. They um, they're just set up for you. So they're very similar to Docker containers, um, except for Docker is a little bit has like its own defined language and it's very like open source. Whereas AMIs is more like closed contained within Amazon's um, internal AWS stuff. So as you can see here, the price is like twenty four cents. So uh, just uh, whenever whenever you're running a deep learning thing or you're using a GPU, just go through and check um, check where the cheapest region is. I just switched between North Virginia and Oregon. That does it pretty well for me. Those are the two cheapest areas. Actually, in fact, they're the only two um, locations in the US that have um, GPU compute at this level. Uh, the, link is not. the link isn't on. Is there one in guides? Go into guides and then deep AWS. Okay, so it should be in uh, the guide slash deep AWS uh, file, all the instructions for this. Um, I'll link it in the slides. Cool. So make sure when you're uh, selecting instance types, you're only selecting P2X large. So um, I'm just going to close that out, remove that other option. And then um, you can pretty much get away with everything else here. I'll, I usually set a max price just so I don't go over like 90 cents an hour. Um, sometimes I'm cheap and I just put it at 50 cents, but like, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Do, just do as you will. Um, keep this standard because this is the size that you're, you want to. Um, this is the size that you want. And then make sure that this 
checkbox is unchecked. So that'll make sure that the volume remains in your, um, just remains in your AWS and or like in your, uh, how, how would I describe? It? I guess your library, sure. So that you can connect to it later. Um, yeah. Now the next thing you're going to have to do is um, create a new key pair if you're a new user. If you've already created one, then you're good to go. So what you do here is you just do create new key pair. And it will ask you to um, do all this stuff. So I'm going to call this one Kaggle. Create. And so this key pair is necessary so that you can connect to your instance via SSH. So it'll put it into your downloads folder. I'm going to open it up in um, SSH. And I'm going to copy it over into this, into my SSH um, directory. So the standard SSH directory is dot SSH. Oh, oops. Whoa, that was loud. Oh, that's fun. One second. Cool. All right. Um, I think that should work. And then once you've copied over your uh, pem, oh, I'm sorry. I realized that was pretty small. So once you've copied over your pem file, what you can do is what you need to do actually is change the permissions on that file. So you just run sudo chmod 400 um, on wherever you put your file. So enter your sudo password. Basically, oh. Wow. Uh, let's see. Cool. Um, yeah, so what this basically does is prevents any SSH warnings. SSH will scream at you if you don't have these kind of uh, permissions on there. It restricts access from anybody other than the uh, admin. So it's just a security thing. SSH, make sure you're safe. Cool. So now that that's set up, we go back to our initialization here. Refresh because it probably won't show up. I choose the Kaggle key pair. And then uh, you can keep the standard. If you want to go into this, go Google IM roles. But they're basically just like permissions for people who are also in your organization. So let's say your business, you want to specify who can use the, um, certain instances. This is what you'd use to uh, add and remove permissions. Cool. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, modify our security groups. And so what security groups basically do is say, like, where can uh, people access your website? Or access your server, rather. And so through what ports or through what access points, rather. Um, so for this process, it's very similar to creating a new key pair. So you create a security group. Um, just press this Create Security Group button. I'm going to call this one um, Jupyter. Uh, Jupyter Notebook Security Group. And the important rules are basically the inbound rules. These are the ones that make sure that you can connect into the server. So the first thing you want to add is uh, SSH. This basically just allows you to connect to the instance. And what I typically do is just um, make sure the source is from anywhere. Because um, I typically don't use a static IP. So I can't just say my IP or a custom IP. But um, for, for most everybody's purposes, you can get away with just having a source from anywhere. And then um, for the next, I'm going to add, I think, two more. Right, let's do three more. So I'm going to add three more rules. So this first one is for the Jupyter Notebook itself. So if you remember when we did Jupyter Notebooks on your local uh, host, you basically had to go to localhost colon 8888. So there you go. And then the next thing you need to do is add 80, which um, this opens up the HTTP port. Basically, it's the uh, port that we'll, uh, we'll use to transfer files from your Jupyter Notebook, basically the, the actual like web pages of the Jupyter Notebook, into your local client when you access from your browser. And then 443 is for SSL. Um, this just makes sure that everything's secure when you're passing stuff over, over the internet. Basically, 80 and 443 are to make sure your Jupyter Notebook is uh, communicating properly with your browser. 8888 makes sure that you can actually connect your uh, Jupyter Notebook from your browser. And then 22 is to make sure that your terminal can connect to the server. And again, you want to make sure that all of these uh, sources allow connections from anywhere. Cool. I think that should be everything. And now let's go back to our setup guide. Refresh, and you, see, you should see Jupyter there. And then everything else is pretty much, um, you can pretty much leave as default. You can play around with these on your own. 
they should be pretty self-explanatory and not that important. <laughs> so yeah, this one's confusing. Cool. And so now you should give a, get a review page. I just go through here, just make sure that I have this setup, this setup, and then this setup. Ugh. Everything looks right. Oh. And then I watch. She get a success message. And now we wait about like a minute, and it should be set up in a second. I mean, uh, in roughly a minute when the um, yeah, when the instance is fully start up. So. Is happening. When you buy something uh, that you want to remove the native things, mm -hmm. um, are you guaranteed a set amount of time? Or um, you can actually set a amount of time that you want. So if you go to request spot instance and you do like request and maintain or reserve for a duration, you can just spot for that entire time. So, the but you're, will yeah, I think you can, I think the price. I think you have to pay a little bit more than this, the um, price of a spot request. Yeah, okay. And it's going to terminate after that time. Like, you can't keep it running. So um, if you know that you will be using your server for the, an exact amount of time, you can do that too. I still think the normal request type is best because um, when I did the request for duration once, I had to just play around with, like, uh, moving instances over and over again because I was like, oh, man, um, I realized that I needed to actually use my instance for longer than I expected. Yeah. So uh, honestly, just the request is probably the best option unless you absolutely know that you can finish everything you need in like some set amount of time. Um, alternatively, I think you can do something very similar with this uh, request valid until, and just say, let's say you only want to work on it for like um, until like midnight tonight, and just set this to uh, and to terminate at midnight. Cool. So. Um, What is this? <laughs> Wait, hold up. I think I may have done something weird, but um, I'll, I'll deal with it later, I guess. Did I really? Just barely? Persistence one time. Well, I may end up just making a bunch of instances, so uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll fix this later. But as we can see here, it's initializing, so it's not re yet ready for us to connect, but um, it'll be close. So I just wanted to go over a few more details, I guess, while it's loading. So I call these gotchas. Literally, these are just problems that I've run into when I've been using AWS before. And like, they can end up costing you money and or credits. But um, yeah, I'll get into that. So first thing is security groups. If you ever have problems connecting to your instances, it's like 99% of the time, it's because the security group is broken. So um, let's say you try to enter from the Jupyter server and you try to enter in like that IP of the server and then 8888. Um, and that doesn't work. That's probably because the uh, that's probably because the secure the ports aren't open or your server's not running. But like usually, if you if you've done pretty well with everything else and you don't know what the problem is, um, I almost guarantee you it's going to be security groups. Uh, I'll get I'll get to this in a second. And then um, the last thing is make sure you stop your instances. Uh, I've definitely left instances running for a long time and used all my credits at uh, one point or another. And so um, yeah, it's a uh, going to cost you. But the nice thing is, let's say you end up running your running like a P2 instance for um, a week or something like that, and you end up using up all your credits and you're like pretty devastated. What you can do is go submit a ticket to the AWS support team and they'll actually refund you most of the time, as long as you close everything and you do everything properly. What's up, Martazza? So are you, um, so you close on like the time you use the moment or the time that you use the Leave it open. So whenever you request it, the time up, then it will bill you. However, if you leave it open and you forget and you're like pretty honest, like um, make sure you can go reach out to the AWS support team. But they can see that you've connected and they can see that you've used it. So if, if it's like if they see you using it during the time that you said you were not using it, they're gonna get pretty mad and they won't refund you for any of it. So just make sure that like you tell them exactly the time that you actually used it if that ever happens. So also, it's probably you probably can't do this more than a few times because um, they'll get mad. <laughs> Uh, additionally, I run into problems with regions, so you notice that I had to switch between Oregon and North Virginia, and I'll actually show you this real quickly. But uh, what can happen is um, you'll run stuff in, let's say, North Virginia, and then you end up coming, turning your uh, AWS back on a week later or something, and you go into Oregon, and you're like, oh, I have nothing running, this is great. But in reality, you have something running in North Virginia. So I'll go to the dashboard real quick. So as you can see here, there's a notification that I have one running instance right now. But if I go into Oregon, 
you see that I have zero running instances. So what I, I can be deceived and go to Oregon or go to this page when I'm logging in initially and think that I have nothing running and think that I'm good, where in reality I have this guy. This guy costing me stealing all my credits, all that bad stuff. Cool. So this is still initializing, I think. Sometimes you can just kind of go for it. But what you'll want to do is go, so when you want to actually SSH in, what you'll do is, um, oh, excuse me, um, you'll take this IP that's right here. You can also find it down here. Copy it over. And you'll want to uh, type in this command, ssh i um, dot, dot slash, whatever your path to your, um, to your key. And the uh, username for this particular instance is Icarus, I C A R U S. And then you just put Icarus at, ooh, well, that's all right. Icarus at the IP. And so it should give you this warning right here and just says that uh, the authenticity isn't, can't be established. Um, I can't really explain what this is, but it happens every time that you try to SSH in. So you're going to be okay. Just type in yes. So, oh, cool. So it's working. The password for this particular AMI is change the world. And you don't really have to worry about the insecurity of that password because you already have this PEM right here that basically just says, this is your identity. This I'm the right user to connect to this instance. Um, and so, yeah, password is almost irrelevant. Okay, so this should take some time because I think it's still initializing. Uh, let's see. Oh, why don't you let me see? Okay, no, it should be good. Yeah, it'll take some. It'll take a second. Maybe I'll restart it. Oh, there we go. Didn't have to do anything. Cool. So we're we're in the machine. We're on. We're in North Virginia right now. Gonna use our GPU box. So I'm going to go back to this uh, go deeper AWS guide, um, and then I'm going to copy over one command. So what I'm basically going to do now is set up a Jupyter server just so you can run stuff. And so I have this nifty command right here, which will basically um, clone a, um, it's basically, it's a gist that has a bunch of information on how to download like the, or set up the Jupyter server and everything like that. The nice thing is you don't really have to care, you don't really have to think about much when you run it. And so I'll show you the simplicity. This is versus like setting up like all the certificates and everything like that that you'd need to make a secure Jupyter server. So this gives, just gives you uh, um, the ability to make sure that your server is secure. So just like paste that command in. And what this is doing is just running this command, this uh, shell script right here. And then it should give you some output about like setting up a certificate. So. Hopefully it will be fast. Oh, oh, the first thing it's going to ask you is to um, make a password for your Jupyter Notebook. If it comes up, whatever. Um, yeah, I have some weird problems sometimes with this particular script. I think it may be an issue of the server itself because this never really happens on my personal computer. But um, what I think happens is like the, the server itself is not done actually initializing. And so um, it'll take a long time to run certain commands at the very beginning. And so right now, I need to set the password for the Jupyter server, so I'm just calling it, I don't know, like, uh, Kaggle. And then verify. Cool. And then for the rest of this, you can kind of just ignore it, because you're going to be the only person accessing it, it's just to make sure that there's no, like, man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, cool. Um, now, what we can do is just start the server. And so, um, what you can do is use tmux, which is actually what I use on my personal um, my personal terminal. So you see the screen bar down here. That's just tmux. Uh, it's basically it basically allows you to run shell stuff in the um, in the background without having to be actively connected to your terminal. If you don't have this and you let's say you disconnect from the SSH instance, it'll actually close down the Jupyter server. So what this allows you to do is just make sure that the Jupyter server is running in the background. So the command I typically run is just tmux new dash nb s space nb. So I just name it nb. And you should see this cool green bar. And now I'm stacked green bars here because I have a, my own instance running and then this one on the 
server. But um, yeah, all you need to do here is just run this command as long as you ran the uh, previous shell script as well. Should take a second. Again, as I mentioned before, there's some weird issues when the server first starts up. So um, this will take some time. But you should see like the standard green text, yellow text, and everything like that when you that you'd see when you start another Jupyter server, let's say on your local machine. Yeah. While that's while that's running, I can go over a few other details. Pretty much the one about Tmux. Um, yeah, so as I said, you can just run, you can use Tmux to uh, run your shell program in the background. Um, it's really great because you can connect to it at any time by just running the command Tmux attach. I'll show you that in a second. But uh, it's also really great because you can do other cool things with it. Like, um, I mean, I use it all the time because I can uh, do cool stuff with my pains. Okay. Uh, I'll show you that right now. So let's say I go into this. Um, so this is kind of the stuff I was doing for work today. Um, basically, I just have like a bunch of different shells here, and then I have a bunch of a bunch of different shells here, and then my my uh, code in Vim here. Um, it's pretty cool. But I'll go back to this, and so now that we have the server running, what we can do if we want to actually do anything on the server itself, the command to get out of this uh, interface here, but make sure that it's still running, is Control B and then D. Control B first, and then um, lift your fingers, D. And so what that does is basically detaches from the Tmux instance. And then to get back into it, Tmux, Tmux attach. Bam. And so um, now what we can do is use that IP that we had before. Right here. Connect 8888. Oh, oh, but the key thing is, because we have to set up those certificates, we can only access it using HTTPS. So, here you go. There you go. You should see this connection is not private issue. Uh, you should be fine. Um, you set up the... So the problem is you self-signed your certificates. This is like a security issue with like um, general websites in general. But because you set up the server and you know that you set it up, it should, be, it should not be a problem. Um, this is only an issue if somebody compromises the server. If somebody had previously compromised the server. Which, if you set it up in the last five minutes, nobody... Nobody has compromised your server. Um, okay, and then you enter that password you set up earlier, and you're in. Cool. And now the great thing is you actually never need to use that shell again unless uh, something breaks with the server. It's because you could just run the terminal from here. And so um, this particular AMI is a little bit finicky, so I have to sometimes just jump into the bash shell by just running bash. And then uh, the thing I'm going to do real quick is just download some repo I have and then show you guys uh, some... TensorFlow on, uh, actually Cross on the uh, GPU. So I can exit this terminal because I've already used what I needed. I have neural network zoo here. Um, let's just do, uh, we'll do dog classification, cat classification. I'm just gonna run all this. Hope everything works. Cool. All right. Um, does anybody have any questions while this loads? Is it possible to paralyze um, like a network? Yes. <laughs> uh, it's like it's kind of hard sometimes. You have to really be uh, very. Yeah, it's kind of an engineering problem more than it is like something that I'll just naturally parallelize because the uh, neural network is very much dependent upon the previous layers. And so if you could somehow separate the computation for each individual layer, that would work. But the problem is there's a lot of interleaving when you use neural networks in this structure. So like too much communication between nodes. Yeah. So there's like weird ways to do it where you like give only like a small subset of the um, data onto a different server or something like that. That could work. Well, you could like test out different instances. Um, like hyperparameters, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually a really good way to parallelize training um, uh, neural networks. Let's just do that. Um, in industry, do they actually use uh, Amazon or do they use neural networks? Uh, 
Um, if you're Google, you use your own hardware. If you're a scrappy startup, you use Amazon. <laughs> That's pretty much how it breaks down. If you have the money, then you can do it. Then you probably will use your own hardware. I don't know what's taking so long. <laughs> this will happen too. Um, I mean, this is like. A, sometimes it's a little slow. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. Cool. Okay. So, um, yeah, it looks like everything's loaded. There's the cat here that we're going to classify as a cat. Here's the dog here that we're going to classify as a dog. Here's some magic neural network action. And then, um, so this first one, we're going to predict the cat. And it predicts the cat with uh, actually a tabby with 62% probability. Sweet. Our neural network is awesome. And then it uh, guesses that this is a Bernese mountain dog with 78% probability. And if you actually look up, if you actually look that up, that is a Bernese mountain dog. Yeah. So uh, this is kind of a like sneak peek into what neural networks are and everything like that. Cool. All right. I'm gonna go home. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>